So welcome to those of you at MoChurch.tv. Um, we, whether you are a kid or a student or an adult, I just want to invite you throughout this series, if you want to bring some colored pencils or something to write with or draw with and some paper, um, one of the ways you can interact with this painting is, I don't mind if the whole sermon, you're, you're looking down and, and sketching the piece of art when we get to it each week. Um, a lot of students of art often engage with classical paintings and, and try to like engage it, and but what they do is they try to analyze and critique it, and while they do that, they sketch their own version of the painting just to help them see stuff that they may not have seen and to interact with it a little bit more. So you're welcome to do that throughout the series as we uh, do the Art of Easter um, this week and the next three weeks, including Easter. So, so in the late 1500s, early 1600s, uh, this Italian artist, uh, Italian painter named Caravaggio, um, really established himself as one of the most prominent Italian painters of his generation. Um, he was this highly influential painter of the Baroque style, which was kind of a, an era, Baroque era was really a response to the Renaissance era. And so he was known for combining realism, you know, like making, you know, art and paintings that looked like, this is what it really looks like. It's not, uh, you know, it's not like this, yeah, that's kind of, it's not post-impressionism, you know, it's not abstract. It's like, man, that's, that's a realistic looking person in his art. And he was also known for this dramatic use of lighting. You'll see that if you look through some of his paintings, you know, if you Google them, he would often spotlight people against a dark background. And that was just kind of like stark. And uh, it was really shocking to his contemporaries. And it opened up a new chapter in the history of art, frankly. So he was super, super influential. So he, he developed quite a reputation as an artist, but he also developed quite a reputation as a violent and touchy and provocative person. Um, he was not a dude, even though he painted scenes, uh, famous paintings from the life and the teachings of Christ and, and people around Christ, um, he would be more likely found in a tavern for sure than a church, and he was frequently just a hair-trigger temper. Uh, he, he definitely felt the need to avenge the slightest insult, like he was ready to scrap and he was just this really, really short-tempered person. And because of that, he had a rap sheet the length of my arm. Um, if you look in between just 1600, the year 1600, and 1606, his police records were no less than 14 times that he appears in police records. And six of those times, he got himself landed in jail. So he was often brushing up against the authorities. He was often stopped for carrying a sword or some kind of blade without permission. By the way, short temper plus blade is bad news. And so this guy's got a hair trigger temper and he's always packing. And so he's walking around with a sword and like, hey, you don't, have, you don't have permission to be carrying around the sword here. What are you doing? And so he would often name drop, and he had these powerful alliances that got him out of a whole lot of trouble where his booty would have been thrown in jail more often. And so that was kind of him and his personality. If I could run down a little bit of his criminal record just in that six or seven year span, the same year that he painted, the painting we'll be looking at in a little bit, The Taking of Christ, he was thrown in prison that year. Uh, a year later, he was arrested for throwing, throwing a plate of hot artichokes at a waiter that he was mad at. Um, he, the year after that, he wounded an official. And then finally, in 1606, he was playing tennis with a guy, and he got into a conflict with his opponent that turned into a brawl, and he killed the man. So the rest of his life was different because he fled for Naples and he spent the rest of his life fleeing from the authorities. He continued his career as an artist, funny enough, but he was always then on the run and laying low and on the lam. And so eventually, you know, he died at the age of 36 and he was even a bunch of mystery surrounding his death, whether someone had killed him or he died of some other cause. So here's the point of Caravaggio's story is... <laughs> More than any other painter in history, Caravaggio knew what it was like to be pursued by the authorities. I mean, that's what we're getting to, in a sense, in the painting. And, and maybe that his lifestyle kind of says why he is known for depicting scenes of violent struggles and torture and death so much in 
his paintings. He was so familiar with these topics in his real life because he was a painter and a criminal. He was packing a paintbrush and a sword. And so he was just a really interesting, interesting dude. So let's move to that painting, The Taking of the Christ. So this is what we're looking at today. And this is a very famous painting by a very famous painter. Um, the video mentions that you just saw that this famous painting was lost for 200 years. Like, ooh, suspicion and intrigue. We won't get into all that subplot, but it did disappear for 200 years where people didn't know where it was and it was rediscovered again. And I picked this painting because it really depicts kind of a scene where we move from really kind of the private ministry of Jesus It kind of ends at this point where he's teaching his disciples and he does some public teaching and things like that. But but really it moves from being this private ministry of Jesus to becoming a very public drama of human redemption. And that's what this scene really moves us to that begins our journey artistically toward Easter. And so there are seven figures in the painting. I'm going to say who they are from, from left to right. But over here on the left, we have John the Apostle. He's one of the 12 main disciples or apprentices of Jesus. And John is fleeing. He's throwing up his hands, his mouth's wide open. He's gasping. And, and so he's, he's fleeing in fear. His cloak is flying back and being held by a soldier, uh, kind of implying he's taken off and someone has his cloak. And so he's jetting. And one of the most puzzling details to scholars is that they kind of you know, just kind of wonder, what does this mean? Is that the heads of John and Jesus seem to meld together visually. And so scholars, art scholars, like, what does that mean? What's he trying to convey there? What's he saying in, in that, like, you know, that their heads are like melding together? And so then you have Jesus. And in this scene, I mean, frankly, Jesus is the person of interest, you know, isn't he always? But he's the one that they're coming after, and he's the person of interest. So then the next person um, next to Jesus is Judas. And Judas is also Judas Iscariot. He is one of the 12 also. But really we're down to 11 disciples at this point because Judas has betrayed him. And this painting captures the moment just after Judas has betrayed him with a kiss. And the kiss was really just the sign of, okay, I'm going to lead you soldiers to the place where I'm sure he's going to be. And it's the man who I greet with a kiss. That's Jesus of Nazareth. That's the one that you need to arrest. So that was their symbol, their sign that they had used to work out to identify Jesus. Then there are three soldiers. One of them's barely visible. The shiny armor, one, two, and then back here is a third behind this guy. There are three soldiers in this, uh, in this basically depiction. And then there's one guy um, who is just a man in the mob Uh, who in scripture it mentions that people have lanterns and torches, like straight up mob style. So this is one of the mobsters basically, you know, with a lantern uh, over here. And so they've all arrived with Judas to arrest Jesus. And in Caravaggio style, you've got this typical black background. I mean, there's no context whatsoever. You don't see the Garden of Gethsemane, which was full of olive trees, which is where historically the scene occurred and took place. So there's just no context whatsoever, Uh, so it's very, very interesting. So to go back to uh, John on the far left, uh, the Gospel of Mark, there are four Gospel accounts, good news accounts of Jesus' life and teachings and scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, Mark kind of mentions an interesting tidbit from this scene in general uh, that isn't depicted really fully in the scene, uh, but you'll see it in some other art, you can read about it in scripture, is that one of the young disciples of Jesus, uh, who was there when Jesus was arrested, he flees the scene, which all the disciples do, but one of them had their cloak grabbed by a soldier, and as they kept running, their cloak came off, and they fled the scene naked. And, And that's something that Mark throws out there. Now, what's interesting is some scholars think that that person who fled the scene naked was was Will Ferrell, actually. We're going streaking! You know, like, he, he leaves there and accidentally he's stripped and he becomes an accidental streaker. Now, most biblical scholars truly believe that that's speaking of a disciple named John Mark. And John Mark actually is who wrote the Gospel of Mark. He was a close friend of Simon Peter. And so most scholars say that was John Mark, and it's him saying in his own gospel, man, I was no better than any of the other disciples that were there. Like, I fled the scene, and I actually fled 
in shame. Like I ended up in my nakedness fleeing Jesus and the arrest and I abandoned him. And so, but Caravaggio, I think wrongly, uh, assumes that this accidental streaker was John. And, and so John, which I don't think any biblical scholars, you know, that that's the guy that they pick, you know, that I know of, but he thinks it was John. And so he thinks John flees with his cloak pulled off. Um, but it is true that all the disciples of Jesus um, fled terrified and abandoned Jesus. So one of the things I want you to notice about Caravaggio's depiction is how he really hones in to make the main focus the two main characters, Jesus and Judas. And he really kind of hones in and, um, you know, he ignores all the peripheral subplots because there's some really interesting subplots like naked dude running and some other stuff that happens. But he ignores all of that and hones in on this. In fact, one writer says, I love this, that there is a little bit of violence that goes on in this scene too, which we'll get to. But this writer says for Caravaggio, the violence hides in the shadows. Like there's just this dark background. We, like what's important to Caravaggio is right here. This is what he wants you to see. Now, for us nowadays, close-ups are not unusual. But back in that day, if you think about all the classical paintings you see, they're zoomed out much further than this, aren't they? Like, this is very close-up for classical painting. And in that era, this is like everything else is cropped out. This is like zooming in on the important people in the shot and cutting your ex-boyfriend out and stuff like that to post your profile pic on Facebook. This is really cropping out a bunch of what's going on. And this is highly unusual in the 17th century to have cropped out so tight. This is in your face, really, in a lot of ways. You don't see the whole mob that's there to arrest Jesus. He limits the mob to four men, like three soldiers and a dude with a lantern. But he implies that there are more soldiers by how tightly crowded in everyone is. And so he has this way of using the spacing. I mean, they're tight. They're so tight in there that it's almost like this looks like a street brawl is going down. Like everybody's bumping up against each other like they're in the club or something. And so they're all tightly put together. But by zooming in on the scene, Caravaggio highlights Jesus and Judas. So Judas is the betrayer. He's the traitor. He's one of the most famous people in history that we think of being a traitor, a betrayal, all that, you got A2 Brute, you got Benedict Arnold, you got Judas as like the king of all betrayers and traitors. And so he was one of the main 12 disciples, but he sold Jesus out for 30 silver coins. And we get these hints throughout the Gospels that he just wasn't getting what Jesus was teaching. He was greedy. He was the treasurer who took care of the money for the disciples as they traveled to feed themselves or whatever. But John, it says in John chapter 12, that he was dipping into the money and he was thieving, he was stealing from the disciples and Jesus' money, even as they traveled. And so you get this picture of like, man, he just never really got it. Well, he's showing up with all these armed men to betray Jesus with a kiss and to point him out as, hey, here's public enemy number one. This is Chuck D and Flavor Flav right here. Like, here he is. Let's get him. So the painting captures the moment right after Jesus has, uh, Judas has kissed Jesus and to, to, to identify him to the soldiers. So notice just that Judas stands in opposition to Jesus. Like, it's Judas and then all this mob. And then here's Jesus, hands folded in kind of a submissive way. And the one disciple that we see is fleeing along with the rest of the disciples. So author Warren Wearsby notes, Judas stood with the enemy, not with Jesus' friends. And so this is a real marking of a change in Judas even pretending to be part of the 12 and one of Jesus' disciples. Then you got Jesus, who's this one lonely, one of the people in the video said the one solid figure. He's the one lone figure, unarmed. The one guy on his side is fleeing he, his hands are folded in submission, he's unarmed, and he's just standing there. And really what's interesting is he's just spent some time, just hours before this, in an upper room with his disciples doing what we call the Last Supper and some other stuff that went on in that room I'll talk about in a second. But then they came out to pray. J Judas fled from that room to go betray Jesus. They come down, Jesus and the rest of his disciples go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which was kind of just out of, you know, if you're thinking in terms of our cities nowadays, it was like just outside the beltway of Jerusalem, you know, the loop around it. So he crossed out of one of the gates of the city. They went to this olive 
kind of forest called the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was a common meeting place where he'd meet with his disciples and he'd pray. It was a rendezvous point often for them. And so in this garden, Jesus prays and he says to the Father, Father, please take this cup from me. And the cup is imagery of you know, God's wrath that he's drinking from on behalf of mankind. And it really just represents suffering. Like he knows what he's about to go through. And he says, Father, if you would take this cup from me. But the conclusion is, but not my will be done, your will be done. And so it's interesting that G- Jesus agonizes through this prayer. I mean, he, the, the humanity of Jesus is so evident in the scene as he just says, I, I don't want to do this, Father, but if you want me to, if this is the only way, then I will suffer. I will take the cup. And the funny thing is, is we're about to get to the Gospel of John, and John, the way that he depicts Jesus as he steps out of the garden is confidence. I mean, he is in command of the situation, but it's because he's wrestled through it in prayer, and then he steps out of there knowing this is the way, this is what needs to be done, I will drink from the cup of suffering on behalf of mankind. And so in John chapter 18, if you want to look at that with me, uh, you can download the Bible app and look at it there, or if you've got a hard copy Bible uh, or at home or whatever. So Jesus steps out of prayer time supremely confident. You'll see he's in command of this situation. He's not surprised. In fact, he dictates the actions of this arresting cohort and, and even ensures the safety of his disciples. And so all this is happening during the Jewish Passover, which is this huge festival where pilgrims come from all over to the city of Jerusalem. So one of the reasons he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane, just outside of the you know, proverbial beltway, is to get away from all the crowds and all the crowdedness to this quiet place where he could pray. So now he's done praying and he steps out of that prayer time. And John 18 says, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden and he and his disciples went into it. Now now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden guided a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. Now, pause there for one second. I'll come back to this, but this is really underlined here in verse 3 and a few verses later, that there are kind of two groups that form the mob. And, and one is a detachment of soldiers, that would be the Romans, and then some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees, those would be some of the Jews. And so keep going, but there's, that's, that's what makes up the mob. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. They were carrying swords. So Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. Uh, John, by the way, doesn't actually zoom in on the actual betrayal of the kiss as the other three writers do. But when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Uh, Is that me? Okay, good. Uh, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. So this is the scene of the taking of Christ. And we really get Caravaggio in the painting highlighting these two main characters, Jesus and Judas, And in the gospel account of John, he's like a simple fisherman. In fact, he uses very simple Greek uh, compared to other writers in the New Testament, um, like Paul, for instance. He uses very simple Greek, but one of the things he's really uh, artistic about is using very simple symbols. And you got to watch carefully. Some of them aren't as obvious. Some are very obvious. But I think that there are some strong, really simple images and symbols that he uses in his accounts of Jesus leading up to the arrest and during and after the arrest. I think that Judas is represented by the symbol of the sword. I think that that image is really a a big image for Judas. So Judas leads this crew, this mob, in to arrest Jesus, and he's got this mob made up of two groups of people. Some were the officials of the Jewish chief priests and Pharisees. Now, basically, these would be the temple police, 
Like they were like a private security force that was controlled by the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish high council or the Jedi council of the Jewish people. And so we see that actually in John chapter 7, the temple police have already tried to apprehend Jesus and they came back empty handed and the Pharisees were like, uh, Pharisees like group of religious people were like, hey, why didn't you arrest him? And their response was, no, no one ever spoke the way this man does. And so they were like, let's go arrest him. Okay, here we go. They're a bunch of Paul Blart mall cops is what they are. And they show up like, hey, let's get him. There he is. And then they hear what he's saying. They're like, dang, like he speaks with authority. Like I've never heard anybody say the kinds of stuff or the kind of boldness that he's saying. Like, I'm not arresting this guy. And they're like backing off and they go back empty handed. So this time they come with more swords, like more people with them. It's the Romans who are in, tr in control over Israel at that time and many other places too but so now there's a detachment of soldiers it says and in the greek there's a word that's used there that basically describes a detachment or a cohort which for the romans would have been 600 soldiers and so there are some scholars who are like surely the romans didn't send a whole cohort with judas and these temple police like surely it wasn't a whole and then other scholars are like are you kidding have you not heard about the romans and so one scholar says this, he says, the Roman way was not to fight battles with evenly matched forces, but to crush enemies with overwhelming superior numbers when possible. Even if they expect to find a few dozen men with Jesus, this apparent overkill is not out of character for the first century Romans. So there's a bunch of scholars who are like, certainly the Romans would have rolled up 600 deep. There's no question about it based on their history. They wanted to go in and smash people with overwhelming numbers. So in the arrest scene, the sword has such a strong presence and gravitational pull. It is all these swords showing up against an unarmed Galilean carpenter. And so that is a huge, strong image. To the right side of the painting, if you go back to the painting, you see those three soldiers and the guy with the lantern but the implication that behind him are just droves of soldiers, more and more soldiers piled upon pile of swords and swords. And then you have Jesus, all these swords against him, hands folded in submission, just standing there like, do what you came to do. Yep, I just prayed about it. I'm, I'm taking the cup, the person of interest, Jesus of Nazareth. The mob's more afraid of him than he is of them. They draw back when he says his name, fall to the ground. And so one of the things that I think is interesting is the background of this is Jesus' teachings constantly in all four Gospels, he's constantly contrasting something called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Honestly, the Jews so respected the name of God that sometimes instead of talking about the kingdom of God, they just said the kingdom of heaven just to avoid saying God. And so Matthew, a Jewish writer, did that a lot. But those were just synonymous words, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And that would be contrasted with the kingdom of this world. And so he would contrast those and basically talk about how he's ushering in a new kingdom. Now, if you put this in the 21st century context, this is what Jesus is saying. A kingdom is an administration, okay? And an administration is just a way of ordering things and getting things done. And so putting it in that context, you're like, oh, I can picture that more. Like whenever the Browns get a new coach, we're going to have the same head coach two years in a row. Isn't this baffling? What is going to happen in Cleveland, Ohio? But every time we get a new coach, that's a new administration, isn't it? It's a new way of doing things, a new order of things. The Cavs get a new head coach. So if you get a new boss in your department, that just means there's a new administration. And that means there's a new order for getting things done. There's a new set of assumptions and goals. And what often distinguishes one administration from another is its list of values. And so at the top of the list, you get the things that really count in that administration. You know, in the middle, these are things that aren't really important. And at the bottom, these are things that we really just despise or avoid. And so that makes a big difference about how things are going to be done then in that administration. So with a new administration, you begin to reorder your values and your goals. And if a kingdom or administration is really just a, a list then, then what Jesus would say in his teachings is, here's the list for the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of this world is about power, it is about money, 
It's about pride. It's about success. It's about recognition. It's about self-assertion. It's all these things. And, and you would often find the kinds of people, you know, at the top of that administration who are rich and they're powerful and they're successful. And so those things that are at the top, funny enough, would be then in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven flip completely over. The things that are in the system of this world, the things that are at the bottom of that list, flipped over and it'd be at the top of Jesus' list, the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. And so you could really kind of call Jesus' kingdom the upside-down kingdom because the values are completely flip-flop. Jesus says things over and over that seem paradoxical, like, hey, the first will be last, the last will be first. Hey, if you want to gain your life, you're going to lose it. If you want to lose your life, you know, you have to lose your life to gain it. Like, what are you saying? And he just kept flip-flopping completely the values. So the people in this world who are first, they're going to be last. And the people in this world who are servants, who are last, are going to be first. It went on and on. In fact, just a few chapters, a few hours before this happens, in what we picture the Last Supper being, John makes it really important. He doesn't really cover the bread and the juice the way that the other three writers do. He talks about what happens when Jesus walks in the room. He picks up a towel, and he starts washing his disciples' feet. And this is the strong symbol from John, the towel. And as Jesus flip-flopping the values again, like again, I am the king of a new administration, a new kingdom. Here's what leadership looks like. He picks up a towel. I mean, it's a totally flip-flop value system. And so in any new kingdom or administration, they always have money, politics, military at the top of that, or some combination of those things. And that's why Judas shows up with a whole bunch of swords. Like, okay, uh, we're, we're probably going to get a fight out of these guys because when push comes to shove, it's always the same things at the top. So we'll poke at them a little bit and then it's, it's going to be on like Donkey Kong. Like there's going to be a fight. So bring the cohort. Here comes all the swords. We're going to crush them. And in the kingdom of this world, that's how revolutions always happen, right? Like there's a revolution. Things are going to be different. Things, new people are put at the top. That's what's different. And things are the same. You know, it's like money, power, those kind of things. And so Jesus is like, nope, it's going to be totally different. In fact, the revolution I'm starting with this towel, the revolution I'm starting can't be fought with a sword. Like, what? It's a totally different, it's an upside down kingdom. It's totally different. Look at one more scene that happens in John chapter 18. This is fabulous. Then Simon Peter, the, the spokesperson really of the 12, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant. Now notice there's a definite article here, and I think that means this could have been like the deputy of the high priest. Like he's, he's a really important servant of the high priest. He's the high priest's servant. So he could have been like some deputy of the high priest. And Peter cuts off his right ear. Like he goes, Mike Tyson on this dude. And people start losing ears over the situation. So Simon Peter has a sword. He draws, he strikes the high priest's servant cutting off his ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. And then it goes on to say, Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials, notice the Roman and the Jews, they arrested Jesus. Now, first off, all four gospel accounts mention the scene, but John is the only one who names names. He's the only one that says, yeah, the one that cut off his ear was Simon Peter. He's like his buddy, you know. It's like he's the one that lopped off the ear. And in fact, the high priest servant, his name was Malchus. We don't get those names from anyone else who writes about it. He's the one that drops those eyewitness details. He was like, yeah, I happen to heard his name. His name was Malchus, which is a common name in that day. And he's like, and I remembered it. It was this dude named Malchus. And so Warren Wearsby says, man, Simon Peter in this situation, he wasn't thinking about God's spiritual kingdom at all. He wasn't also thinking about what is Jesus talking about this new kingdom? He says, Warren Wearsby, Peter made every mistake possible. He fought the wrong enemy, used the wrong weapon, had the wrong motive, and accomplished the wrong result. Meaning, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, it's not against people. Our weapons aren't the weapons of the world. These are all different scriptures. Our weapons, we don't fight with the same weapons as the world. Like Peter got everything wrong and he reaches for his sword and starts hacking. One writer says this, this is fabulous. He says, when push comes to shove, what's Peter's instinct? Pull out that sword. Aren't we kind of like Peter, he asks? We say we're on the side of justice or peace or fairness, 
But when a challenge arises, we feel for the sword hilt. We merge the kingdom of this world, sword on top, then money, power, success, recognition, into our philosophy, whether it's Christianity or something else. So here's the point. The images that I think just contrast with each other here are this. Peter reaches for the sword. Jesus reaches for the cup. Remember, this is what he wrestled with. He's like, do I have to drink from the cup? Do I have to suffer? Okay, but your will be done. He walks out of there with confidence. Things start getting crazy. People are bunched in, like some street fight's about to happen. And all of a sudden, Simon Peter pulls out a sword, reaches for a sword, and he lops off a guy's ear. Jesus, put that away, because he's just prayed about this. And he's like, I have to take the cup. Like, I'm going to suffer. And, and it just reveals more of this upside-down kingdom thing. Like, man, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to submit. I'm here to serve. I'm here to suffer. And I'm here to sacrifice. Because those are very high values in the kingdom of God. And so one, one Bible commentator actually talks about this. I think it's fascinating. Is that when they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane to leave the city of Jerusalem, they have to cross the Kidron Valley. I've been there, I've crossed this little brook, basically. It's like a creek bed, and most of the year it's empty, but there's times where there's rain and stuff, where some stuff flows through it. But we crossed it, and it was dry, and right on the other side of it, outside of the city proper, kind of, if you will, there's this olive trees there, the Garden of Gethsemane. There's olive trees there today. And you cross this thing. Well, back in Jesus' time, scholars are like, this is crazy, because what would have happened during the Passover all these pilgrims are there, packed into the city. They're there for temple sacrifices of lambs. And I mean, the numbers of lambs that would be slaughtered for all of these pilgrims in the temple was unbelievable. In fact, 30 years after this scene, there was a census taken, and the count historically of the lambs that were slain at the Passover was 256,000. I mean, this is a major thing going on in this festival. And so you can imagine that the temple, which is right next to this, right next to this Kidron Valley and this empty brook, basically, there was this lamb's blood always on the altar, being dashed onto the altar. And from the altar, there was a channel that led down to the Kidron Creek. And, and so this blood from the lambs would flow down to the creek and it would run like a creek during Passover time, right where Jesus and his disciples crossed to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And you have to think that Jesus prays about, can you take the cup from my hand, Father? Can we do it in another way? No, my will won't be done here. Whatever your will is, I'll do it. And then he walks his disciples across a creek of lamb blood. And he looks at that knowing that's always been a foreshadowing and a symbol for what he's about to do. And he looks at this and says, this is what I've come to do. This is my mission. I've come to take the cup. I've come to suffer on behalf of mankind. That's the upside down kingdom. And that's what he's been trying to teach his disciples. That's why he picks up the towel. That's why he says, I'm going to pick up the cup. Is that the top of the kingdom list is submission and service and sacrifice and suffering. And so here's my question to you. Here's my challenge from this is really simply this. And you're the only one that can answer this. I'm not even going to throw out hypotheticals to be like, maybe for you it's this. Maybe for you it's this. Like, good, wrap it up, preacher. So I'm just going to give it to you. And this is the question. In the situation you're going through this week at work, in the situation that you're still struggling with from last week, the thing that went down, or maybe a perpetual situation that you live in, what does it look like for you to pick up the cup instead of reach for the sword. Like, what, is it, what does it look like for you to say the kingdom values are to submit and to serve and to suffer and to sacrifice like Jesus did? Man, what does it look like for me? Instead of me reaching for the sword, instead of me getting Caravaggio and being quick-tempered and hair-triggered and striking back quickly, what does it look like for me to actually pick up the towel and, and drink of the suffering that comes from serving someone in retaliation instead of striking back in retaliation. What does it look like instead of reaching for the sword to reach for the towel or the cup? Because those are the values 
of the kingdom, submission, service, suffering, sacrifice. Um, in fact, interesting thing is one of the things that art scholars have pondered and are so stricken by from this painting that drives them crazy is why, since this focus is on Jesus and Judas, why are they not at the center of the painting? And that was kind of typical for Baroque style, I believe, is that it was often off-centered, you know, like it was like lower than it should be or off to the side. And they're like, this is so crazy. They're over here. And what's in the center of the painting? It's so random. Armor-clad arm of a soldier. Like that is the central thing in the painting. Why? It's so interesting. Most art scholars believe that maybe Caravaggio is inviting you, the viewer, to kind of see yourself in the reflection of the armor, to look at that as a mirror and to say, do I see Judas in myself? Do I see the sins of Judas in myself? I would say, do I see myself as being one that answers problems with the sword? I come in like the Romans to crush. I bring the blade. This is what I do. And so to look at that for some self-reflection, to say, how do I respond when the moment gets heated? What do I do? How do I respond? In fact, what's interesting about Jesus is there's a lot of grace in the scene. His healing of Malchus's ear, because he heals Malchus's ear, is an act of grace. One, it's an act of grace to Malchus because he shows in the scene, my values are love your enemies. You don't respond with the sword. You respond with grace and you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's also an act of grace for Simon Peter, isn't it? Because if Simon Peter lops off a guy's ear and he leaves there with his ear in his hand and goes back to the high priest, Simon Peter could have been crucified for what just happened. So this is an act of grace for Simon Peter also that he heals Malchus, basically eliminates his boneheaded mistake. It's an act of grace for both of them. Here's the last thing I want to point out from the painting and I'm done. Um, most people believe, looking at the scene, and I totally agree. Notice earlier on when I described Caravaggio, I had a portrait of him up for a while, didn't I? So most people believe in the scene that the man with the lantern, lantern is a self-portrait of Caravaggio. So it looks just like him. And so scholars are like, oh, it's absolutely certainly him. He's, he's put himself in the scene. And, and in fact, he contrasts completely He's entering the scene contrasted completely opposite to the one disciple who's fleeing the scene, John. And, and people are like, what does he mean by that? And most scholars are like, you know what he means is basically he's making the point that even a sinner, even a man of the sword like Caravaggio was, always walking around packing and retaliating and avenging anything that was done to him, that even a sinner, 1,000 years after Jesus, after the resurrection, has a better understanding of Christ than even his friends did. And I, I just want to say, this is a privilege that we have. Sure, they got to walk with Jesus, hear his teachings, but they were constantly wrestling with, who is this guy? Like, is he who we think he is? Who is this guy? He's raised from the dead. Okay, now we're convinced. But we have this thing of perspective and history. It's like hindsight's 2020. If you want to search and investigate Jesus, you have the privilege of stepping back and saying, I can search the scriptures to say, did the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, really lead up to and forecast and foreshadow and predict and prophesy about Jesus the way that, the way that I think they did or the way that scripture says they did? And wow, I can look back from perspective of Jesus and see all that happened in the aftermath, and I can have the perspective to be like, wow, this moment of the cross and the resurrection, they changed history. So much came from that. Is Jesus really, and, and Caravaggio says, man, even a sinner, someone like me who doesn't even claim to be a religious person, I'm no saint, even a violent man like me, I can have a better perspective on who Jesus is than one of the people cropped in in the shot with him. Man, that is a privilege you've been given is to say, I can search the scriptures to know, is this man, is this event pivotal in history? Man, I would urge you to do that if you haven't. Let's pray.